Plains Indians. The best known picture of an American Indian is a warrior in buckskin riding a horse, wearing a headdress of eagle feathers, and carrying a spear or bow and arrow. This is a picture of a Plains Indian, and it appears in many Hollywood westerns and on the American five cent piece. There were many tribes of Plains Indians, for the northern American prairies or plains stretch from the northern forest of western Canada down to the states of Oklahoma and Texas in southern USA. It's interesting that our image of the Plains Indian is only true for the last couple hundred years. It was not until the 1600s that Plains Indians began to ride horses. There were no horses in America until Spanish soldiers brought them in the 1500s and 1600s. Some of these horses escaped and ran wild on the prairies of America. It was these wild horses that the Plains Indians learned to tame. Before they had horses, the Indians hunted buffalo on foot. Buffalo were huge bison or wild cattle which traveled in very large herds. A big herd might have millions of buffalo. It was difficult to cross the prairie because these animals blocked your way. The Plains Indians had various ways of killing buffalo. Before they had horses, Indian hunters would quietly creep up close to the herd. Then they would fire their arrows together. There was always the danger that the herd would stampede and trample the hunters. Another method was to drive the buffalo over a steep cliff. There are a number of places on the plains where this was done. Once the plains Indians had horses, they preferred to hunt buffalo on horseback. When the tribe started to use guns, they could kill many buffalo. Artist Paul Kane describes a buffalo hunt in the Red River Valley in 1846. The hunters carried their bullets in their mouths so that they could shoot faster. They could ride right into the herd, shooting at close quarters. They would drop an article of clothes on the slain buffalo to mark it for themselves. Then they would continue the hunt. After the hunt, the Indians would skin the animals, and the women would dry the meat and store it in fat. A single hunt might kill more than 30,000 buffalo. The Plains Indians received nearly everything they needed from the buffalo. Of course, they used buffalo meat for food. They also used the buffalo skins for clothing, blankets, and the covering of their teepees. These teepees were cone-shaped tents, which were easy to put up and take down. The Plains Indians were nomadic and followed the animals they hunted. Since these animals were plentiful, Plains Indians usually led a comfortable life. They developed complex religions and social rituals, as well as specialized societies or clubs. There were also rituals and customs for hunting and warfare. Many Plains Indians fought hard against the settlement of the Great Plains. The American government discouraged the hunting of buffalo because without the buffalo, the Plains Indians would not be able to fight. With the buffalo disappearing, the Plains Indians had to give up fighting and move into government-sponsored reservations. Kane, Frontier Artist Since Christopher Columbus first met American Indians in 1492, many Europeans had been fascinated by Indian life and culture. As a result, there was a demand in Europe for drawings and paintings of Native Americans. European artists who had never seen an Indian supplied most of this demand. But in the 19th century, several painters traveled into Indian territory to make an authentic record of native life. One of the first artists to do this was the American painter George Catlin. In 1841, Catlin published a book of his work. Catlin's work helped inspire another important frontier artist, the Canadian Paul Kane. Paul Kane was born in Ireland in 1810. His family moved to Toronto, Ontario, Canada when Paul was nine years old. The young boy was not very interested in school. At that time, there were still Indians living in wigwams in the Toronto area. Young Paul liked visiting the Indian village instead of going to school. Since Paul spent little time in school, he was largely a self-taught artist. In 
He also became a surprisingly good writer, considering that he had not spent much time studying spelling or grammar. After working some years making and decorating furniture, Kane was ready to travel. He spent the years from 1836 to 1841 living and traveling in the United States. Then he traveled in Europe from 1841 to 1843, studying the great painters of the past. He was back in the USA until 1845, and then he returned to Toronto. Immediately upon his return, Kane headed into the wilderness areas around Georgian Bay, Sault Ste. Marie, and Lake Michigan. His plan was to sketch Indian life before it disappeared forever. American Indians were dying so rapidly from European diseases such as measles and smallpox that many people believed they would soon vanish as a race. Their culture was threatened too. As white settlers demanded more land, Indians were being herded into small pieces of land called reservations. Here they could no longer practice their traditional way of life. Kane wanted to capture Native American life while it still existed. Kane returned to Toronto at the end of 1845. He had received one good piece of advice, and that was if he wanted to travel into the wilderness, he would have to go with experienced people. He was able to get the support of the governor of the Hudson's Bay Company, Sir George Simpson. In May 1846, Kane joined the annual canoe fleet of fur traders going west. Kane would travel all through the wilderness areas of western Canada and northwestern USA. During this time, he made hundreds of sketches of Indian life. Although Kane faced incredible hardships during his travels, he was able to see what he wanted to see. He was able to take part in one of the last great buffalo hunts and killed two large bison himself. Traveling west with the fur traders, he visited many forts and trading posts. He saw and painted a prairie fire. He shot a grizzly bear at close range and killed several wolves that attacked his horses. He learned to travel long distances on snowshoes in winter. Finally, he arrived at the Pacific Coast, where he made some fine drawings of the West Coast Indians. European diseases had reached there just before Cain. 1,500 Indians had died near Fort Vancouver in the summer of 1848. One wealthy chief had ruled 1,000 warriors and had 10 wives, 4 children, and 18 slaves. Now, he had only one wife one child and two slaves. Cain had not come too soon. However, there were tribes still unaffected by Western culture and Western diseases. Cain also traveled widely around the Columbia River in northwestern USA. Everywhere he went, he sketched Indian chiefs and scenes of native life. On his return trip, he encountered a large war party of 1,500 braves on the warpath against their traditional enemies. He was able to sketch the leading chief, Big Snake, who was later killed in single combat during the battle. When he arrived back in Toronto, Kane gave an exhibit of his sketches and watercolors. Most of the rest of his life was spent turning these drawings into finished paintings. Newspapers All the great cities in the world now have newspapers. But newspapers as we know them today are not that old. The very first newspapers began long after the invention of printing. They started in Europe in the 1600s and were usually only a couple of pages long. For a long time, newspapers were not very common. Governments didn't want public discussion of their policies and decisions. Often, they closed down papers or taxed them heavily. The stamp tax on newspapers and pamphlets was one of the causes of the American Revolution. Newspapers began to grow in size when they discovered advertising as a source of income. Nowadays, advertising is the main revenue source for most newspapers. As newspapers became more widely circulated, they could ask for more money for their advertisements.
By the late 18th century, newspapers were in common use in Europe. The 1800s and early 1900s was the golden age of newspapers. Improvements in transportation, communication, and printing processes made it easier to collect news from near and far and to publish papers more quickly and more cheaply. The Weekly Dispatch and The Times, both of London, England, were leading newspapers through much of the 1800s. The Times was one of the first papers to include illustrations. It was the first newspaper to use a steam engine to turn the presses. When the tax on newspapers was reduced in 1836, the Times was able to increase its size considerably. In 1840, it began to use the telegraph to collect news stories. In 1855, the tax on newspapers was finally lifted. The Times made its greatest reputation during the Crimean War between Britain and Russia. British armies fighting in Russia's Crimean Peninsula were not only unsuccessful in the war, but were suffering severely from illnesses. The Times sent out the world's first war correspondent, William Howard Russell, in 1854. His reports from the battle lines had a powerful effect on the British public. A war fund was organized to help the soldiers. Russell forced the government to accept the offer of Florence Nightingale to organize nurses to travel to Crimea. A photographer, Roger Fenton, sent back photos from the war, which were published in the Times. Meanwhile, in America, a more popular approach to newspapers had developed. The newspaper had spread west with the pioneers, and nearly every little settlement had its own paper. American newspapers were cheaper and livelier than British ones. They were aimed at the average person, rather than the governing class. Examples of the new style of editing and publishing were Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst. Hearst, especially, employed sensational and emotional writing, which aimed at stirring up the public to action. Hearst is sometimes accused of starting the Spanish-American War of 1898 with his overheated editorials. Nonetheless, his methods were successful in raising circulation and were widely imitated. The modern newspaper contains more than hard news. In fact, news may be a fairly small part of it. Advertisements, gossip, show business, photos of celebrities, sports, stock market prices, horoscopes, comic strips, weather reports, and much more are found in its pages. The modern newspaper is a total entertainment package. A question for the future is whether electronic newspapers will replace paper newspapers.